Welcome to Insight, produced in partnership with KLCS in Los Angeles. Today we are chatting with Peter Mindick, President and CEO of the Braille Institute, who has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Peter, for joining us today. Thank you so much, Mark. It's a pleasure to be with you. So the Braille Institute, everybody knows, but they don't know the scale of your operations. They don't know how many people you impact. They don't know your funding models. Let's start to unpack how this organization has so positively affected not only people who, are, who, who have uh, vision uh, mm -hmm. issues, mm -hmm. but also general society so beneficially yeah. here in the United right. States. Well, we have been in business for 100 years. We are celebrating our centennial this year, which is a busy and exciting time at Braille Institute. But we, have, uh, we are a large nonprofit. We've got a budget of about $25 million. We have multi-sites throughout Southern California where we're providing free programs to people that are living with vision loss. Um, and we serve tens of thousands of people every year. So it is a large scale operation, which gives us great opportunities to serve more people. And I can tell you, Mark, that uh, looking forward, the need for our services probably will never be bigger than it will be over the next 30 years. In fact, the National Eye Institute uh, did a recent study and, and they estimate and expect that the number of people uh, living with vision loss is expected to double to 30 million people in the United States. So we've been blessed with scale and resources and history and we have a wonderful opportunity to grow and serve even more people in the coming decades. And the thing that is so fascinating is how you started. You talk about the social good mm -hmm. mission, but you talk about we are a business. We are a business. We have revenue flows. We have products and services that we provide. We have constituents. Mm -hmm. We have customers. We have mm -hmm. funders. Yep. This is a, a fascinating thing because mm -hmm. You're, you're advancing civil society as opposed to a particular um, shareholder agenda. Right. And we just right. had American business leaders coming mm -hmm. together and saying, we need to think about civic good. And you are at the center of civic good. You are right on. I saw some of that uh, article. And you mentioned this where the private sector and the social sectors, I believe, are starting to merge. I think they're obviously going to remain distinct. but. The for-profit entities are starting to understand that, you know, what is our social purpose? It's not just uh, allegiance to a single stakeholder, the shareholders of, of corporations. They have uh, more to do in society. At the same time, the social sector is moving more towards taking on some of the aspects of the private sector in terms of understanding the importance of focus in the work that they do, being strategic in terms of resources, managing the financial resources of the organization so there can be long-term financial sustainability. Mm -hmm. So there are many aspects of the private sector that I found very much uh, applicable to our uh, organization at Braille Institute and really taking some of that experience and applying it to help push us forward and be around and sustained for another 100 years because that's the way we think. We've got the resources and we have a lot of work to do based on the need or people that are living with low vision or blindness. So it's a really exciting time. And I, I talk about it, it's like a business school case, but it's real to actually sit and have to make decisions and figure out what's the best way forward for, for Braille Institute and its mission. And one of the things that is so important about your mission is uh, you actually sit at a intersection of educating people and helping people mm -hmm. who are visually impaired. Mm -hmm but you're also educating and helping people understand that people with visual impairments, their, their minds begin to create strengths that they do not otherwise have as a sighted person. Mm -hmm. And those strengths are really important for society. They're really important in terms of how do different fields take advantage of those strengths to create abilities within those fields that they would not otherwise have access to. Right. Yeah, I, I think the diversity of people that we work with and provide services to, again, it's all ages from birth to people that are over 100 years old, um, a whole continuum of vision loss. I mean, you know, blindness and legal blindness is a relatively small percentage of people mm -hmm. that are uh, visually impaired, which is good news. 
sometimes we think that, you know, we only work with blind people. That's not true. We really are focused primarily because we're trying to grow. The large segment is this low vision segment, which is pretty much older people. It's right. mostly age related. Uh, the big driver of vision loss for younger people is the linkage between diabetes and obesity and diabetic retinopathy. So that's a huge issue, particularly in the Latino community. So um, we have um, just these tremendous opportunities in front of us to move forward. You know, to your question of, of um, helping people unlock their future, be it employment. Employment is a huge issue right. for people that are visually impaired, as you probably know. Because so much employment is connected to the ability to see. It, we don't think about it. it. Exactly. So unemployment rates are unacceptable. They're 70, 80 percent for right. people that are visually impaired. Um, and that's, that's going to be a big rock to move over time. But we are working very hard to get people in a, in a position from an independent standpoint, being able to be able to orient and be mobile with their visual impairment, because that's a key part of independence, being able to get around town, if you will. Right. Um, the ability to learn technology, that is the fastest growing area that we have, no surprise. Right. You, and you look at the power of mobile and accessible technology for the sighted world. In fact, what that can do for someone who's blind or with significant vision loss is bigger than for a sighted person. It is a huge leveling of the playing field for people to be able to acquire skills, finish school, and ultimately find work that can sustain them economically. Well, just converting text into red with, without having to pay a reader, right? Yeah. Or without having to go through the process of finding a tape and, yep. and so on and so yep. forth. So, that, so those, those technologies are gonna be um, instrumental for people to be able to advance their lives. So that's, as I said, is an area that we're spending a lot of time on. Let's talk a little bit about the programs that you provide. Yep. Uh, deconstruct the organization and give us a sense of, of how you're organized. We are uh, providing a wide variety of programs. They're all for free. That's another thing we have, and we'll talk about our funding strategy. I forgot to mention that. That's also very unique for, for organizations in the nonprofit sector. But we are most focused on um, sort of low vision assessment when people come into Braille Institute, they're referred by a doctor, of mm -hmm. course, and we do a low vision uh, evaluation to see kind of where they are, understand what their goals are. So that's kind of the intake process. Uh, I mentioned orientation and mobility, about somebody's ability to orient and travel independently, some with cane, but increasingly, again, this technology thing is, <laughs> I mean, the devices now are reading and telling people where they are what's up, what that sign says, et cetera. So it's really powerful from that standpoint. Uh, we also, technology I talked about, this technology training so that people can learn those skills, huge way to level the playing field for people. You also function as an information clearinghouse because you don't require people to navigate that whole changing and ever-changing technology landscape individually. You're actually helping them. It, trying to curate what is available, and we try and provide choices for people so that we're not just kind of an Apple organization or something. So trying right. to provide enough choices for people that, that work for them. So the technology training is critically important. Um, we also provide what we call independent living skills. It's for people to really take care of themselves, to be living alone, grooming, personal care, cooking, you know, some of those more mundane things, cleaning up their apartment of their house. Um, so that's another aspect to it. So it's a, it's really a wide variety of things. I want to just touch on the funding strategy, which is, it's, I don't know if it's unique, but it's close to being unique. Bob Atkinson, when he started, uh, got the original money to, <clears throat> excuse me, to start the organization from a wealthy family, the Longyear family. He lived in Massachusetts. They were in California in the wintertime. Uh, and met Bob and saw what he was doing. So it was an original $25,000 gift, $5,000 a year for five years to start the printing business. And the first product was to print the first Braille version of the King James Bible. And from that day on, I look at our earliest materials and because people say, well, how could you have built an organization of the scale and size from private philanthropy? We have virtually no money from public sources and two thirds of our funding comes from bequests. And so people look at that and they understand, well, how did that happen? Well, Bob Atkinson saw how it worked to start the organization. And so from the earliest documents we have, he had these codicils in our, our 
kind of magazines and the way we communicated to get the concept out there, leaving money in your will to Brown Institute. So we built up this endowment. We have these resources. However, most of the people that supported Brown Institute were middle class. There's some wealthy donors, but most were wealthy or in, uh, middle class individuals that saved their money. People were dying at a younger age, kind of late 60s, early 70s. So they weren't living as long. And so that's starting to shift. So it's, it's unique. It's worked great for us. <clears throat> but we're also getting ready to say we got to start developing some other revenue streams because people aren't living as they're not dying as early. They're living longer. They'll need some of those resources. And you know, the saving act, um, ethic in the country has really eroded to some extent. So most people are heavily in debt. So I don't think we can depend on that being available. But it's an interesting way of how we got started. Peter Mendick, thank you so much for explaining how the Braille Institute has evolved over these last 100 years. Congratulations on your 100 year anniversary. Yeah. And thank you so mm -hmm. much for your insights. Yeah. Thanks so much. Thanks, Mark.